Hey, what's going on guys? It's Brian with Simpens Comics and welcome to a new edition of the Hot and Cold List where we're covering the hottest and coldest trends in comic books this week. With me as always is my co-host Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo. What's going on, Jack? Man, let me tell you something, Brian. It has been a crazy week in comics. We added some new content. We made a big announcement. I set up at a convention this weekend in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm back here for another week in a full slate of CBSI content right here on the official YouTube channel of CBSI and ComicBookInvest.com, Simpleman's Comics. Right. So speaking of CBSI, we'd like to take the time to say, as of right now and going forward, this video will be brought to you by CBSI Swag. CBSISwag.com, that's where you can get all these cool CBSI t-shirts. I know both of us have gotten shirts from CBSI Swag, right, Jack? Absolutely. CBSISwag.com offers all those great shirts you see Brian and I wearing right here on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. We're talking the brand new Skeletor shirt Brian's wearing right now. We're talking the CBGB Homage Design t-shirt that you've seen me wear as well. And we're talking the brand new G.I. Joe inspired design, which if you know Mr. Bolo, you know I love. But we've also got hoodies, hats, we've got ladies clothes, we've got everything the comic family needs to represent CBSI right at your next convention. Check out the link in the description of this video, take you right over to CBSI Swag. And that's not all, we are going to be giving away a hat and shirt during this show, so make sure you stay tuned for that. So moving on to the hot and cold list this week, as always, the hot and cold picks come from CBSR contributors and authors. So that's right, Brian. Bigger than any one person, this is the spec super team of CBSI writers, comicbookinvest.com authors, who come together like Voltron to form this list. If you've never seen the show before, you're in for a real treat, because we've got a diverse group of gentlemen who are going to come together and give you a list that gives you the overview of the market from various different perspectives. And... We got a special treat tonight because we have another guest pick and it's going to come from one of our favorite people from the YouTube comic community and we're talking about Carolina Chris 26. Yeah, so make sure you guys are watching, following, and commenting on this video because you never know when we may reach out to you to be a guest pick on the Hot and Cold Show. If you're interested in checking out Carolina Chris 26's YouTube channel, the link to it will be in the description of this video as well. But... We're not going to hold back the suspense anymore. We are going to get in to the hot and cold list. Starting with our first hot pick from Mike Morello, author of the Cover Tunes article on comicbookinvest.com. Hey, everybody. Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes. Um, hope you had a good week. And this week, I'm coming to you with my hot pick. And my hot pick is Everything Bronze Age Marvel Keys. Um, and obviously... This is more of a public service announcement than a hot pick. I think it's pretty obvious that these books are hot and sought after, but they are going up substantially. It seems every six months or so, a new one pops and goes up to crazy, crazy heights. Um, and when they do that, they seem to go up double or more what they were prior to that. Um, sometimes it has to do with a movie or a TV show. Sometimes it has to do with nothing. Um, I think the books that I'm about to talk about are immune to movies and TV. I think they're popular characters regardless. And I think it might be time for us to start talking about these in terms of blue chip phrasing. Um, obviously, Silver Age blue chips are out of reach for a lot of folks, um, as are Golden Age. And they've, Golden Age has been out of reach for a long time now. Um, but as a result, collectors are turning towards the Bronze Age, some of these big characters that are popping up in movies and TV, and that they've just loved for their whole lives. I mean, I remember when it was this one. This was sort of the first one to pop and go huge. Um, this and maybe Thanos, um, and now it's kind of untouchable for a lot of people. Um, does anyone remember when this book was cheap? Neither do I. Um, right now, it seems like it's this. This one's going up crazy, crazy amounts if you've been following prices lately. Um, it's insane. Um, and based on SDCC news, it is now this book and this book, which are creeping up as well. Um, but I don't think it stops there. So what's next? Is it maybe this book? It very much could be. Uh, my sleeper pick is this one. I think it might be that, especially if we get a movie. This is really hard to get in high grade now. Um, but it's more than likely going to be books like this or possibly this. Um, now, I know this is a tough conversation to have for a lot of people. Um, 
The guys that have been in this hobby for a really long time probably can't believe that we're talking about these books in terms of thousands of dollars rather than hundreds of dollars, but facts are facts. Um, and I also realize this may be a tough pill to swallow for a lot of collectors that are on a budget. Uh, these are big boy books, there's no doubt about it. But let's face it, if you're paying attention to, say, I don't know, this hot and cold list, for instance, or other spec tools that are available to you, you're making money. Um, you're flipping books and you've got money to invest. Where are you investing that money? Uh, well, for me, for my money, I'm investing in these Bronze Age books. I think this is the time to buy them. I think this is the last time that we're going to be able to buy them at reasonable prices. Um, and I think that these are the kinds of books that you buy uh, to hold, to pass down to future generations. So I say choose your favorite character. Choose the thing you're most excited about. Invest the money that you've made on speculating into these books. And I don't think you're going to be sorry. I think they're going to go up, they're going to spike, and they're going to stay there. They might plateau a little. They might dip just a touch. But in general, I think these are safe bets. I think these are all immune to movie and TV uh, success or lack thereof. Um, and I think now may be the last time for us to grab some of these books. So with that, that's my hot pick. And uh, I hope you have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. So Mike Morello is talking about Marvel Bronze Age keys, right? You get a lot of pushback a lot of times because you always hear Bronze Age had a large print run, which there's no denying it. But at the same time, Bronze Age keys, especially in a high grade, is extremely hard to find or extremely out of everyone's price range. And due to that fact, I think a lot of people are going after these mid grades now, which is driving the price up on those as well. So what do you think about it, Jack? Well, I totally agree, and especially what you said about mid-grades, and I'll even include low-grades in that. You know, a lot of people want these keys, and if they can't afford the grade that they really desire, they're more than happy just to pick up any copy that they can afford and hopefully be able to trade up and get a better copy as time goes by. Another thing to point out is the fact that a lot of these covers, you mentioned condition, a lot of these covers are feature black cover art. There was so much black border, black background type cover art during the Bronze Age and even the white backgrounds um, that it really contributed to a lot of these books not being able to hold up condition wise over time, which of course puts a major premium on those high grade pristine condition copies. Now, you mentioned the high print run and I totally get that people say that I, you're absolutely spot on. But as long as a more modern book like New Mutants 98, the first appearance of Deadpool, which has an astronomical print run, trades for the value that it trades for, I have no doubt that these Bronze Age keys will continue to go up in value. And I think a major reason for that is where Marvel is going Phase 4 and Phase 5. We now know that Marvel is dipping their toes into the horror pool, with Doctor Strange followed by Blade, both having horror tropes. We are definitely going to see more horror properties from Marvel hit the big screen. And that, of course, is going to make books spike. And most of these horror books from Marvel were released during the Bronze Age. So I have no doubt that this is a trend that will continue to be hot. Great pick from Mike Morello. I agree. Great pick from Mike. And thanks for showing some of those books because it reminded me of books that I have on my freaking hunt list. But they are... I'm try just trying to find the money to be able to pursue them. So the next pick on the list this week comes from Indie Spotlight writer Andy Tomberlin. Hey, what's up, CBSI Nation? Andy here, Indie Spotlight Series, comicbookinvest.com. What's hot this week? Uh, I'm going to have to step out of my realm a little bit here and go with Totally Awesome Hulk. Uh, the series is seeing a lot of movement here over the past couple days. Um, and it's, it's throwing a red flag there. Uh, something Something's brewing. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is right now. Uh, maybe maybe somebody knows something I don't. Uh, but a lot of issues are seeing a lot of movement. Uh, number one, number three, e even number two seeing some movement. Uh, number 16, and if you can find the 1 in 25 variants uh, for a decent price, uh, they're selling upwards of $50 right now. Uh, so something to look at. Uh, totally awesome Hulk. Seeing a lot of movement right now. And uh, that's my hot pick along with this so here we are we're talking about totally awesome hulk i remember when these issues came out you you saw some people you saw like a, a hills and valleys some issues were kind of hotter than others i noticed also this was one of the first introductions that we had to that variant artist scon at least that i will remember i know he was doing a lot of variants for this and it was brought to a lot of people's attentions but totally awesome hulk what do you think about this jack 
Well, I think this plays into, again, Marvel Cinematic Universe spec. And we don't have any concrete evidence here, but speculators are always trying to get ahead of the game. And I actually applaud them for that. Uh, one thing, if you watch the Civil Men's Comics YouTube channel, you know that myself, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, I'm a long-term play kind of guy. That's where the real ROI is. So I think, and this is going to get a little uncomfortable here, I think this comes down a lot of, in a lot of ways to race. I think it comes down to the fact that we know for a fact that there is a Shanky movie coming. And because of that, we know that how Marvel likes to expand these universes and, and broaden the, um, the kind of playing fields around each character. And as we are looking into the future of Marvel movies and with uh, New Agents of Atlas being an extremely popular new series from Marvel's publishing side, I really think people are starting to look at Amadeus Chow as Hulk and say, could we possibly see this in the MCU? Another thing is we just talked about Marvel moving into horror. And if you've read the Totally Awesome Hulk series, then you will know that there is definitely some of those like Marvel monster tie-ins. He mentioned uh, issue number three with Kid Kaiju. I really think that we're going to we're going to see Marvel monsters hit the big screen at some point. And because of that, a lot of people are looking at this Totally Awesome Hulk series where there's a lot of kind of low-priced first appearances, the books that used to be hot, even some Ben Stein CSI Hot 10 comics books of the past. And there, people are looking at them and saying, man, these values have depressed. They've they're kind of been cold list books for a while, and now they're seeing buying opportunities, and these books are starting to raise in value. So I would definitely keep an eye on Totally Awesome Hulk. I think there's meat on the bone there, and I think there's plenty of opportunities to buy and sit on these books for a couple years, and you may be making some serious money. Worst case scenario, this was a pretty critically acclaimed s series, and it's something that I don't think you're going to lose money putting your money into this series at its current value. But it's definitely rising. It hasn't hit the kind of peak you would expect to see of a hot book or a hot series. But it's definitely moving up quickly. And that's the kind of thing the Hot and Cold Show is all about. We're giving you overview trends of the market. And this is one that you may be sleeping on. You may not be paying attention to. And you may need to. So thank you, Andy, for that pick. And now we are going to get into our guest pick this week. And again, it comes from Carolina Chris 26 YouTube channel. Make sure you guys check them out, but not until you check out this pick. Hi guys, I'm your boy Carolina Chris 26, and my hot pick of the day is Symbiote. That's right, absolute carnage is dropping, and carnage is about to be after anyone or everyone who ever wore a Symbiote suit. That's right, guys, I said it, Symbiotes. Uh, Reaching as far back as Amazing Spider-Man 252, first appearance of the Black Suit Spider-Man, uh, with pretty much connections to every Venom and Carnage story ever since. Um, you got um, the Amazing Spider-Man 361, first appearance of the man himself, Carnage. You got Venom number three, first appearance of uh, the God Symbiote. No, this is always a hot book, in my opinion. And you got Amazing Spider-Man 300, first appearance of Venom. It's a newsstand. You got uh, Amazing Spider-Man 798, first no Norman Osborn as Red Goblin. You got uh, Venom Lethal Protector number four, uh, first appearance of Scream, uh, cameos of Phage, Agony, Riot, Lasher. You got Venom Lethal Protector five, uh, first full appearance of Phage, Agony, Riot, Lasher. So anyone and everyone who ever wore a symbiote is a possible victim. Carnage is hunting down all current and former symbiote hosts to reclaim the codex to unlock the direct link to the symbiote god No. Wait a minute. This just in. Venom number two is being directed by Andy Serkis. Right? Yep. Venom number two is being directed by Andy Serkis. So that not only makes this a hot pick, but a nuclear hot pick. Symbiotes, guys. Symbiotes! And that is my hot pick of the week. So there we have it, guest pick, which I owe an apology because I'm sitting here saying Carolina Chris 26 when it's evidently Carolina Chris 26. So my bad, but I hope my mistake was overshadowed by this totally kick-ass pick. And we're talking symbiotes, and I'm talking 
that he's right. It is nuclear with the news that's coming on right now. But what do you got to say about this, Jack? Well, I'll tell you a couple things. First off, shout out to Carolina Chris, my Carolina partner. We've got Andy Tomberlin on the show. We've got myself and we've got Carolina Chris. So the Carolinas are well represented on the Hot and Cold show. I had an opportunity to meet this guy at Heroes Con. And let me tell you something. He's as much of a character in person as you saw in that video. And also... Watch out, comicbookinvest.com writers, because these guest picks are bringing it. I really don't have a ton of information that I could possibly add to what he just said. Those books that he highlighted are all absolutely in demand. The only thing I would say is check out comicbookinvest.com, the Bolo List article that's on the website today. Check out that back issue Bolo section, because I talked a little bit more about a couple of the books that he talked about. I talked about some connecting issues that will also be popular, but I'm going to go ahead and save that for the article. Head to comicbookinvest.com and check that out. But Brian knows I reached out to him when I was at the convention. We were talking and he asked me, he said, hey, how's it going? And I said, man, let me tell you something. Symbiote books are selling. It was incredible. And, you know, we can point to movie speculation or we can point to the Absolute Carnage series. Another thing that I really think is just the case is people of a certain age – I'm talking about uh, uh, early 20s up to about 30. This crowd loves symbionts. They grew up looking at Venom as an anti-hero versus a lot of the older people who grew up loving Peter Parker and looking at Venom as a really a true villain and have a hard time jumping on board with this kind of bandwagon. So I would say that these books are hot. I sold so many Venom and Carnage books this weekend. It was the most consistent thing people asked for. I sold through a short box on Saturday. I had to bring two extras on Sunday, and I continued to clear out Venom and Carnage keys all weekend. So if you're out there selling, let me tell you something. Make sure you are loaded with as many symbiote books as you can, because I don't think these books are going anywhere anytime soon for the reasons that Chris just absolutely eloquently stated in his video, Carolina style. <laughs> yes. And... Make sure you guys check out his channel. Great channel. A lot of great comic book hauls on there. And like great comic content in general. And once again, the link to his channel will be in the description of this video. So please check it out. And thank you, Chris. Love the pick. And hope to have you on again sometime. Absolutely. Next hot pick comes from the mass speculator himself, Topher S., author of True First Article on ComicBookInvest.com. What's up, everybody? It's the mass speculator home on my comic throne. Coming at you with a hot pick for this week, I'm going with Underground Comics, a section of the market that's rarely discussed. Even though certain printings of these books do very well, they're often overlooked by the majority of comic collectors and speculators. I suspect this has to do with availability, how many stores even sell these kinds of books. And that's exactly why you should hear me out. Look at what foreign collecting and second printings are doing. Trust me, it wasn't that long ago nobody cared about that kind of stuff. Maybe the newly announced cartoon series written by the writers of Silicon Valley will generate more interest in these types of comics. As for this book, in its time, Sheldon's counterculture comic was a hit, appearing in campus newspapers and other publications well prior to its comic's debut in Feds and Heads No. 1. Early issues of Freak Brothers are actually comics that collect these strips, and they're rare in their own right. Hell, there was even a board game included in Playboy magazine, amongst some other rare comics. Feds and Heads 1 is the book to look for. Anything with Fat Freddy's Cat on the cover. A bit of caution, though. If this genre interests you, a fair amount of research is needed. Determining printings of these books can be a daunting task, even for the most experienced collector and seller. You don't want to be buying a 30-second printing of number one thinking it's first. That's it for this week. Catch you next time. So there we have it, Jack. Topher is talking underground comics as his hot pick seems like he's also doing some trend analysis here we're seeing foreign variants foreign comics starting to get hot underground comics it is kind of a niche but there is demand for it and what do you have to say about it jack well i think tover's right that a lot of us kind of overlook these books when we're at lcs's and conventions and um most of it is due to our own ignorance I don't truly have a great working knowledge of a lot of these underground comics. Um, a lot of them tend to be kind of R-rated, tend to um, be very sexual because they weren't adhering to the comics code of the time. But an announcement was recently made that an animated film is coming called The Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. 
based on the underground comic of the same title, starring the ever-popular workaholics duo Blake Anderson and Adam Devine. This film could possibly be this generation's Cheech and Chong. And with the popularity of stoner comedy in the marketplace, there's no telling what a big hit animated film from those two could possibly do to that comic. And we know the way comic speculators are. They tend to follow trends. And if this book pops off, could others? And if that movie's successful, could other Hollywood studios look to these underground comics and see if there's anything that they can mine for possible IP? Because we know right now, Hollywood studios love comic book IP. So there you have it, folks. Underground Comics is on the hot list this week. And rolling into the next hot pick this week, we have the Reading Pile author, Dan Piercy. Hey, Dan Piercy here of T. Piercy's Comics, home of the Reading Pile on CBSI. Now my hot pick for this week, nah, it's not the hottest book on this list, but it is The Submariner. I mean, what? People are anticipating or maybe they're wishfully thinking that uh, Namor is going to pop up somewhere in the next batch of Marvel movies. I'd like to see it. Would you? I always thought Namor the Submariner was cool. And as a consequence, in particular, that first Submariner book from 1968, the Thomas and Basima book, it's moving, y'all. So what are you going to do, Bolo? You're going to trash my pick again? <laughs> I'll see y'all. I'll see y'all. I'll see ya. So we got Dan Piercy, reading pile, and a character in its own right, talking about Submariner, Namor. But we started getting news of this, people's the Easter egg, or what was perceived as an Easter egg coming out of Avengers Endgame when they're kind of hinting at Submariner. But you are starting to see some of these books take off a little bit in the market. What do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I know Dan was uh, kind of expecting me to trash this pick, but i got to be honest with you, I love it. I've been saying for a number of years that I think Namor is headed to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Obviously, Aquaman was a big hit for DC, but DC is a mess right now with their movie slate. And we know that Marvel can tie this story into Black Panther very easily. And there's so many comics where these two interact, and they at many times often end up teaming up as well as going head-to-head. -head. So I really think that this is kind of a no-brainer. And for a long time, when you look at classic Marvel characters, Namor was one of the most underpriced, undervalued books on the market. And I'm talking about for the last five, seven, ten years, you could have picked these books up for way less than they were trading during the Silver Age. Not only that, I think a lot like Blade, there's going to be some modern books that people are going to be dollar bin digging trying to find. And with that, I think there's going to be opportunity for more spikes. I think the, a lot of the crossovers between Black Panther and Namor are going to be popular, and as well as a lot of the kind of modern number ones and those high ratio variants, because nobody was ever buying any book with Namor featured for the last about 10 years. But that could all change with one big casting announcement, with one big surprise cameo, all could be erased, and Namor could be back as one of the top flagship characters for Marvel. And I think as we move into Phase 5, that is something to keep an eye out or be on the lookout for. And you watching this video, let us know in the comments of who you would like to see play this role in the movie. Because I'm dying to know what people think. So thanks Dan for that pick, and we're going to roll right into the next hot pick this week. And it comes from the Usual Suspects author, Peter Renna. What's up, everybody? This is Peter Renna, writer of CBSI, here with my hot pick this week. And my pick this week has been on this list before. I uh, didn't want to do it, but uh, these books are still hot. So even though you've seen it before, you may be sick of seeing it, but Eternals is still hot. Like, I know everybody's looking at, you know, number one, of course, hot, two, and three, and five. Yeah, these were all hot, but it's not just those. I'm trying to fill out my run. I'm missing a few issues. I can't get 9, which I think is first Sprite, and 10 for a decent price without having to pay for it. You can sneak some auctions in 
in and out. But uh, for the most part, those common issues are still, you know, $10 to $20 if you want to get them in decent grade. And uh, that's just a little bit more than I want to pay. I, well, I want to pay cheap prices for my books. I'm a dollar bin digger after all. But uh, these books, there's like, if you look at eBay sales, there's uh, like, averaging like 100 sales of Eternals books a day. And it's not just that first series. It's the second volume, which sold the entire set 1 through 12 for 40 bucks the other day. It's the third by Neil Gaiman that I had in Dollar Bin Digging. That sold for $25 for the set of seven uh, just the other day. And if you can pick these up for a buck a piece, seven bucks turned into 25, that's not too bad. And then you got the next, you know, the fourth volume, which is also not only nine issues, that's also a $25 set if you just want to go out there and purchase them for cheap. Or you can find these books in dollar bins. It, it's up to you. Now, this one is the variant, so you're probably not going to find that in dollar bins, but still, one in 75, it's not too bad if you can grab it for like 25 bucks, in which there are a lot of copies like that. Eh, there's a lot asking for more, but still. Eternals books are still moving, and they're moving at a pretty steady clip. So uh, get them if you can get them cheap, and uh, we'll see if they stay hot. Eternals, it's hot. It's been hot. We've had it on this list a couple times right now, and it's for good reason because there is constantly movement in the market. Here's my thing about Eternals, Jack. Oh, what? I'm leaning in for this yeah. one. Go ahead, Brian. If there was not a movie right now, we would not give two craps about Eternals, and I think once the movie comes and goes, I think we're not going to give two craps about Eternals again. But it is hot, it is moving in the market, but if you read any of these books, I haven't read any of them that have been like, man, that's a really good story. Here's the thing, we're talking about trends, and this book is hot because, and Kevin Feige we trust. We talk about that a lot here on Simple Man's Comics, and these books keep moving. There's no denying it's hot, it's just I have the concern of What's going to happen to him once the movie comes and goes? What are your thoughts? Well, Brian, your take disappoints me because I know that you were around when Guardians of the Galaxy was announced. And there's no way you were familiar with Star-Lord. And I know you didn't know who the hell Rocket Raccoon was. And that Hulk 271 book, that thing didn't go for anything before that movie was announced. So I really look at the, this series and this team as just an absolute parallel to the Guardians of the Galaxy. The Guardians hadn't had a series in years. And that 90s run, while I'll give you, is a better read than anything the Eternals have ever put out, was so far from collectors' radars and attention that that number one issue was less than a $5 book. And at this point, now, the, no one can ever imagine a Marvel Universe, either on the publishing side or the cinematic side, where Guardians isn't front and center. So, a lot of what you said is absolutely valid, but the best point you made is in Feige We Trust. I don't think at this point they're looking for good stories. I think they're looking for good concepts. And I think The Eternals was kind of a product of its time. And I think now is the perfect time to take The Eternals, kind of adapt them for today's modern era, integrate them into the universe and give the cosmic section of the Marvel Cinematic Universe a good shot in the arm. I also think it provides for a, an absolute diverse cast, and that's the thing that makes this cat this movie a home run is the casting. We have Academy Award winners, Academy Award nominees, Emmy Award winners, and the, the movie is stacked with A-list names. I think this movie is going to open the door for a lot of other movies being able to cast a higher caliber of actor. And I really believe that Eternals is going to be a hit. I would be shocked if Feige doesn't deliver another one out of left field and over the pump. I would be shocked if Feige doesn't take another one out of left field and hit another home run out of the park. Also, I mentioned earlier I was at a convention this weekend. I invested heavily in Eternals once there was the even rumor that this was the next movie, the next series coming in Phase 4. Because they were just cheap pickups. Because of what you said, nobody really loved the series. We talked about the high print run of Bronze Age books. So I was able to pick up Eternals 1 for $15 and under. I was able to pick up issues 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. Those key issues that we now know are first appearances for under $5. And this weekend, I had an entire wall on my back wall. Excuse me. <clears throat> and this weekend, I had an entire shelf on my back wall filled with Eternal books. And I sold 75% of them for my asking price. And my asking price was high market value because the reality is people didn't have them. They're chasing them now. They weren't ready for this announcement. They weren't prepared. They doubted. And now the market is saying, not so fast. The Eternals are here, and you better get ready. 
Normally I always say the book's better than the movie, but I think in this case it's going to be the opposite. And I'm just a little bit sour because I really want to see Nova in the Nova Corps. I'll take any type of comic book movie content I can get. So I would, yes, I will be there in the Eternals. And I have no doubt that the movie will be great. I just have reservations about the book. And I'm, I've been wrong more than once. So there's no doubt I could be wrong on this one. But either way, great pick from Peter. And we're going to roll right into the next pick. This comes from Run the Tables author Clint Jocelyn. Good afternoon, CBSI Nation. Clint Joslin coming to you my hot pick of the week. And my hot pick of this week kind of runs parallel with what's going on with as we creep closer to Spawn number 300. There's a lot of buzz around that book, and not for good reasons, but what you're seeing um, is reverberations of other McFarland work starting to heat up. And this week especially, you're seeing some good heat with this book right here, ASN number 298, and a couple of the other issues after that. Reason being, that book is hot. Why? It's a cameo of Eddie Brock. It's McFarland's pencils. It's his first cover on that. It is a book that has value and can still continue to go up, that has some value down the road and is well now. You know, again, we talk about things like that in consecutive order. That's a good book to start with that's popular because of ASN 299, obviously, another one of his brilliant covers. And then the, the one that's sought after and everybody looks at, ASM number 300. But if you want to get a good starter's point, ASM 298 is a hot book now, but I believe it's going to continue to go up. It always will have value, will go up in value, and it's a hot book right now. So as we roll towards Spawn 300, ASM 298, 299, 300 are really starting to see some heat too, but specifically that 298. It's, it's a hot book right now. So that is my hot pick of the week this week, ASM 298. So there we have Clint Johnson's pick. And if you haven't checked out that Run the Tables article on comicbookinvest.com, highly recommend you do. Great, fantastic read, but we're here for the pick now, aren't we, Jack? We are. One thing I like about Clint's pick is he related Spawn, This Road to 300, the last few issues leading up. And then he parlayed that back into that ASM 298, 299, 300. And, the, and you're also seeing that similarities because McFarland's doing an homage in 298, 299, and 300 coming up. But what do you think about this pick, Jack? Well, I like this pick for a few different reasons. Um, number one, I think a lot of Chris already gave us a lot of those reasons in his pick earlier. Symbiote stuff is hot. So you got that right there. Secondly, you know I'm a big McFarlane guy. I'm a big those original image creators guy. And uh, a lot of people my age are that way. And we are starting to get to a point in life where we have the type of financial income to go get the books that we want. And a lot of those books are these McFarlane keys. So I think that plays into it. I also think he's right about the Spawn stuff really playing into keeping these books kind of in the zeitgeist of the hobby. Because the, all of these homages are coming out and people are seeing them and they want the originals. But I'm going to bring up one more thing. He mentioned 298. I, I hear him on that. But um, if you've watched the, the CBSI Bolo show this past week, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't watched it, you don't even have to watch the whole thing. Check out the micro content on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 97. We talk first, appearance on, first appearances on Simple Men's Comics. And my belief is that a first appearance is a first appearance. And with that being said, as Brian would say, Amazing Spider-Man 299 is the first appearance of Venom. There's really no other way to shake it out. He's right there. It is what it is. You can try to make it 300 because that's what's been said for years and years and years. I know it's a sexier book because he's on the cover. But ASM 299 is the first appearance of Venom. And there's tons of cameos before and all those books are valid and they're awesome. But 299 might be, in my opinion, the most undervalued Marvel book that exists on the market today. And I brought up the fact that I was selling at a convention, which, again, I suggest to you guys, whether you make a big profit or not, it really teaches you a lot about the market. People are looking for that book. A lot of people can't afford 300 And if they can't afford 300 they're trying to get 299 And then a lot of the younger crowd, they're looking to buck that first appearance trend. We hear that the market decides. Well, just because the market 30 years ago decided something doesn't mean today's market isn't going to change that. And we saw that when Marvel put out that information, that, that book that highlighted Hulk 180 as a first appearance or Avengers 195 as Taskmaster's first appearance. And those types of things have changed the perception in the way that people are looking at first appearances. And because of that, 299 is massively undervalued. Now, I'm not saying that 300 isn't worth the money that it's going for. It's an iconic book. 
But 299 hasn't quite hit that Hulk 180 stage of getting that credit and reputation that Hulk 180 has. So I think Clint's exactly right. 298, 299, great value buys. 300, always going to be popular. Brian mentioned earlier in the show, CGC just slabbed their 20,000th copy. So obviously, people are buying this book. People are sending it in to get graded. It's sitting in people's PCs. It's being flipped. It's being sold at conventions, eBay, everywhere you buy comic books. That book is a definite landmark comic book. But 299 and 298 are criminally underpriced. And I sold a 299 and two 298s this weekend. And I think mainly the reason why they were able to sell is the price tag. They were more affordable than that 300 on the wall and people were willing to grab those books and start building that run. Right, so great pick from Clint. And our last hot pick this week comes from Mel V from the Drunken Chat Sun, Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. What up, Mighty Mel V here with my hot pick for this week. I'm going to go with Del Auto Vengeance books. Now, not only is one starting to heat up with a lot of sales recently, but the other covers have seemed to garner some interest. So, Del Auto Vengeance variants. So, there we have it. Mel V from the Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. Real quick, before we talk about the pick, make sure you check out his new show, Drunken Chat Son. It is the marathon of comic book chat on Friday nights at Two weeks ago, I think they went over about six hours. This past Friday, they went over about eight hours. So it's like an all-night, just pop in, pop out as you want. Talk about comics. They're all having a good time. But the pick, Jack, we're talking Del Auto Vengeance. I remember these got hot for a little bit, especially when there was hype on America Chavez. But what do you think about this pick? Well, I understand the speculation of America Chavez, especially with Chris Evans exiting as Captain America. I think everybody's looking for these kind of American superheroes to see who is going to be that person. Also, there's talk of a female-based Marvel team movie or team TV show. And with the, both of those things kind of in talks and in the works, America Chavez's name comes up. And a lot of people do speculate on these vengeance books. But I don't know if I can really rock with Mel on this one. Love Mel. Love the drunken chat, son. But I really just don't know if I really feel like this is truly a hot book or maybe just a talked about book, a buzzworthy book. Because a quick check of eBay shows that one of these books hasn't been sold in about four or five days. And the prices are all over the place depending on condition. Um, and the, there's real value in the set as a whole because that number one in mint condition can go for about $45 to $50 with shipping. And the sets only go for about $50 to $60. So I really don't know if this set is really popping off. I think that the Del Auto art adds to it. But the trade dress of this set really kind of takes away from the Del Auto art. So I don't know if people are really buying this for Del Auto himself. He certainly has a bunch of home run variant covers on the marketplace. He's one of the most beloved artists in the game. Speculators love him. Collectors love him. Um, so I, I totally see where Mel's coming from about this being, say, a book of note. If Mel had this on his easel of elevation, it's something I could totally get down with. But as a hot book on the hot and cold list, I don't know. I got to kind of pass on this one. So there you have Mel's pick, and that wraps up the hot list this week. And we're going to roll right into the cold pick this week, going back to the Reading Pile author, Dan Piercy. Cold pick. Now, the book I hold in my hands is The Realm by Jeremy Hong, published by Image Comics. Now, this is a book that definitely had its day in the sun. The first issue had a handful of variants. This is the tour variant. There was a secret variant that came in a brown paper bag, y'all. A brown paper bag. And it sold upwards to $100. But what's going on now, huh? Huh? This is another example of a book that was hot. And now it's not. The Realm by Jeremy Hahn. Set a drink on it, y'all, and it'll chill. Chill. I'll see y'all. Realm. I loved this issue when it first came out. Enjoyed the first few issues of it. But I think a lot of these comics have a hard time keeping traction 
because there's so many comics coming out week after week. So people branch off, start reading another one, and it gets laid by the wayside and never get back again until people start picking it up in trades. But what do you think about this cold pick, Jack? Well, you know what? It's definitely a cold pick. Um, the reality of the situation is we are comicbookinvest.com. So I'm going to look at this from an investment standpoint. And the reality is when we're talking investments, the best investment and really the only investment in most independent comic series is issue number one. So Dan pointed out the variants, and definitely there was a time when they were red hot. Reality is that time has passed, but I think that's – we talk about this a lot in the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. That's really just the market being cyclical, and you just mentioned it. Like People go into other books. There's other things that come up. Reaver was the hot image book last week. There's already hot new um, – maybe not image, but hot new independent books coming out today like Dead End Kids. The that Coffin. Have the Coffin is the, – yeah, the new image book of the day um, that definitely have people's attention. And speculators have such short attention spans. But I'm surprised Dan missed the opportunity to plug his favorite topic, and that's selling in sets. Because the reality is, with Realm being this cold, and it being such a good read, there's great opportunities, not just the variant play, but to pick up these runs and pick them up cheap. And we all know, you're just one option piece of news away from this set being red hot. For it to be the type of series that's trading like some of these current option and in production series is that you can flip for major money. So, beauty of the cold pick section, there's buying opportunities. So if you haven't read Realm, check out the trade. That's a great way to get an idea if you think that this is an investable movie property. That's a bolo for you guys. That's something I don't think a lot of people are doing. People look at investing and reading like two separate things, not me. I use reading as a research tool. So read that trade, pick it up. I bet it's cheap on Amazon. I bet you can even get it from a link from Simpleman's Comics. And the reality is you pick that trade up, you make that decision for yourself, and then you go dig those cheap issues, put those runs together, pick up those underpriced variants, and then you're just one option news away from hitting it big. And that's how the long-term ROI on a lot of these indie books is played. You can't expect the heat from the initial release. We heard from James Hake himself when he was on the Simple Bits Comics YouTube channel. And if you're not familiar with him, he's the CEO of Scout Comics. But there's a 50% reduction in readership from issue one to two, and another 50% reduction in readership from issues two to three. That tells you right there that in essentially every indie series is cold after issue three. So this isn't surprising. Um, this is the trend in the hobby. And this, once you know that information, gives you real buying opportunity. So go out and grab those Realm books if you feel like this series is for you. Grab those trades if you've never been exposed to it and see if maybe it is. So great pick, Dan. I totally agree. So this is a pick that's easily cold, but once again, could reach those levels it has before and be hot again. Our next cold pick this week comes from... Mike Morello from the Cover Tunes author, and let's see what he has for us this week. Hey everybody, Mike Morello here again from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my cold pick for the week. And this week I've got to go with one of my favorites, Adi Granoff. I can't tell you why he's cold, but he's cold. And he seems to have almost always been cold. Um, we've had this conversation before about others like um, Alex Ross or... Uh, even Brooks, some of those kinds of uh, really great illustrators who just don't seem to get the love in the secondary market, and I don't really know why. Um, shameless plug for my article, Cover Tunes. If you read that, you realize I, I feature Adi Granoff a lot, and the reason why I'm able to feature Adi Granoff a lot is because they're cold. Um, cover Tunes is based around cheap covers that are beautiful, um, and so he's got a lot of them. Um, you take a look at a book like this that was briefly hot and has cooled way down. That's beautiful. One of my personal favorites, this one I think for obvious reasons, or a book like this, which was also briefly hot and then cooled right back down, at least in its virgin version, um, but for whatever reason, these books just don't hold any value, um, but I really can't explain why an artist that great is that cold all the time. But it is what it is, he is cold, so Adi Granoff is my cold pick for the week. Have a great one, everyone. Thanks a lot. Jack, this pick pains me, but I do see the reason behind it. Adiganov, one of my favorite... <laughs> Adiganov is definitely one of my favorite artists, but there are a lot of his covers that 
if, if I had my way, they're priceless because I love it. But the truth of the market is the truth of the market. And these covers, a lot of times, they're cold right now. What do you think about this, Jack? Well, you know, I definitely, I, I first, my initial reaction when I saw his name on the list was, eh, really? But you know what? Mike's right. You know, I think back to uh, one of the, again, to reference the convention I, I was a vendor at this weekend one of the boxes i have is just titled hot marvel cover artist or hot cover artist uh excuse me and you know i had adi granoff books in that box i don't think i sold a one and it was funny how many times people flip through that box and that box was filled with you know your typical cover artists that those of us who have been speculating for a period of time are used to del Otto, adam hughes j scott campbell but you know what the newer collectors they're not looking for those guys they're looking for Shannon Mayer. They're looking for Kendrick Lim. They're looking for Derek Chu. Clayton and Crane. Clayton Crane. And though that's that's exactly right, Brian. And those are not guys that um, I initially think of as kind of like the A comic book artists. And I'll throw Jenny Frizen's name in there as well. People are looking for her work. And um, so I just think it's a changing of the guard. And there's precedent for this. Because if you remember, you know, Brian, you and I, when we first got into this as kids collecting, Alex Ross was the man. And he's still the man today. It's not like his work has gotten worse. If anything, it's gotten better. Uh, his Immortal Hulk run makes that series. Well, I mean, so many cover A's sold. Cap just, those Captain America covers as well. Right. But so many Immortal Hulk books sold on a speculation market just because of those covers. But the reality is his name doesn't carry that name recognition within the speculation community, meaning that just because Alex Ross does a cover doesn't mean it's going to be hot. There are so many under ratio, gorgeous Alex Ross, high ratio variants that can't get half ratio. So I, I really think and I, that never made sense to me. And now I look at the same thing happening to some of these other guys. And I think it's just market saturation. Yeah. Over time, you essentially get desensitized to seeing their work. And people are always looking for that next person. And the names that I mentioned, those are just some of the names that have been making buzz within the last year. And that's kind of a what have you done for me lately sort of thing. So with that being said, I, I totally get Adi Granoff as a cold pick. Although it's sad because I feel the same way about his art you do, Brian. Yeah, that Scarlet Witch variant he did is still like one of the best Scarlet Witch. And I also love like some of that. He had that run of Spider-Man covers and what was it? The... the late 600s or whatever it was but there's no denying you can pick those covers up for cheap right now so great buying opportunity but it is a cold pick this week moving right along our next cold pick comes from the dollar bin digging author peter renna this is peter renna back with my cold pick for this week i actually had to hit up the filing cabinet to grab some amazing spider-mans out of there for my cold pick but uh i'm gonna say cold is a uh, sony's non-venom even Morbius, I guess, uh, film properties they keep talking about making. They assure you they're they're coming, they're coming, but who knows when they are. I mean, a book like this, I picked this up for a dollar this week, but first Night Watch, I know Spike Lee was interested in one time. This is still a pretty cheap book. If he makes it, it'll probably jump again, but uh, until we get any firm announcement, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. And they still say that Silver and Black are coming, and while these books are still a little pricey, particularly uh, First Black Cat is still up there, some copies uh, sneak down there. You can sneak an auction and get one in mid-grade pretty cheap. High grade's going to be high, but uh, even that 9.8, it was, it was a $2,500 sale, $2,500 sale, excuse me, and a $1,500 sale within a week of each other. So prices are wildly inconsistent. Uh, so you might be able to get a good one for a good price. And then you got, uh, you know, again, for Silver Sable, which this, you know, you can get this for, uh, you know, 10, 15 bucks pretty much on an eBay. Or, uh, you know, who knows? Or, you know, for fun, you know, grab this out of a dollar bin too for the 90s, you know, for, uh, for a series. But these books are uh, not really doing much until we know more. So, uh, I mean, now could be a good buying opportunity if you think they're actually going to get made. They may, they may not. Who knows? It's a gamble. All this is. But uh, that's what I think is cold this week. So, Jack, there we have Peter's pick. He's talking about non-Venom Sony Spider-Man characters. So I agree and I disagree with kind of what you said there, Brian. Um, I agree with Tom Holland's here to stay. Seven more Spider-Man movies. The last movie made over a billion dollars. Um, we talk about in Feige we trust, and we now know that the MCU is going to be more integrated with these Sony Spider-Man releases. I have high hopes. We also talked about symbiotes, and we talked about the popularity right now of the Tom Hardy movie, especially with this 
uh, sequel coming with Andy Serkis, and I think that the Sony universe is in prime position to be successful. But the books he highlighted, those were books that people jumped on because of FOMO. Those were books that people ran and got because of rumors. The simple mention of Spike Lee saying, I'd like to do a movie, made people run out and buy Nightwatch. Well, I'd like to do a movie. And you're not going to go run out and buy it just because I say it. Now, I know Spike Lee and me, we're not the same person. But it's not like we had any concrete evidence that Sony was going to bring Spike in to do this movie. And I think this is real indicative of the market that we're in right now. We're in a market where a rumor hits a website and then an app sends out an alert. And then all the new collectors and speculators run and think, well, if this app says that this is happening, it's got to be happening. So all it took was some app to go out there, put that alert out, and tell you that these rumors existed. And then all the new spenders and collectors ran out and bought those books. But again, these were always just rumors. There was nothing official, nothing concrete. We didn't have Sa Silver Surfer Black Cat movie actually really making any sort of major casting news. There was never any director attached. There was always just rumors. And a lot of these rumors always fall by the wayside. So, do I think more Spider-Man movies are coming? Absolutely. Do I think that more of characters in the Spider-Man universe should be specced on? Absolutely. Do I think the ones that were attached to the rumors that went on in the last two years are the ones to look for? I have no idea. And the truth is, neither do you. So, yes, they're great buys right now at the price. But are they really going to go with those characters before they do Craven and Craven's Last Hunt? Are they going to do that before they do Sinister Six? I really don't know. Are they going to do that before they do some of the other symbiote characters like Anti-Venom or Agent Venom? You know, that I'm not really sure. And the reality of the situation is people ran and bought those books and now they're holding the bag. And at the same time that that was going on, that's when you could have been buying Eternals books dirt cheap. And we knew concrete that that was going to happen as you and I talked about, Brian. Because we already knew that the celestial stuff was happening. It was in the movies. So you got to be a, a savvy speculator. You can't jump on every single piece of rumor and news that goes out there and buy up every book. Now, if you bought Silver Sable number one for a dollar, you didn't really hurt yourself. You're sitting on the book cheap. You can make a move at some point if this character shows up. And there's still a good chance it could. But again, this is at this point just pure speculation. We have no idea. And you're just shooting shots in the dark. And we all know how dangerous that is. So my advice, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, I'm telling you, don't just chase every single rumor that comes out there. Make sure you start seeing those breadcrumbs in the movie. Make sure you start seeing things that are more concrete. Make sure you're following that director attachment, that writer attachment. Make sure that the studio is really putting money into a movie. Like we know is happening right now from Warner Brothers in DC with New Gods, where they've got Tom King writing and Ava DeVegni already attached as a director. There is a safe investment. You know that's going to happen. So therefore, you should feel good putting your money into those keys. But on these Sony properties, I agree with you, Brian, these things are coming. But what things we don't really know. So right, what, with what Jack said, wherever you're getting your news from, make sure you at least try to verify it from multiple sources. That way you can have that warm and fuzzy feeling that you're going down the right road with the titles that you're buying. But if you have those titles in hand and you're seeing those alerts, that would be a good time for you to list those titles and make your money off of them. Great point, Brian. And with that being said, we're going to move into the last pick on the cold list this week, and it comes from Run the Table author, Clint Jocelyn. It's just like heaven being here with you. You're like an angel too good to be true. Ah, CBS Nation, you like that little intro with Angel Baby? That is, for some of you that know me, that is my favorite panel of all time. I mean, you can't get much better than that. Uh, it's Cable holding the baby, letting her know that everything's going to be okay. If I could find that OA, I'd probably sell my car, my house, maybe one of my kids to grab that. I'm just kidding. But uh, that is my favorite panel of all time um, because it represents a lot within the X-Men universe. And it was a pivotal point. And I am speaking to no other than X-Men number 205 the first appearance of Hope Summers. This is the J. Scott Campbell cover. But a couple of things with that. She was the first mutant born after 
M Day, which is key, and the repercussions of that and what went on going forward. I don't want to spoil anything for you, but that is a very important X Men storyline, in my opinion. Uh, a couple other things. She has a good following, a solid following. She was in Deadpool 2. I think we're going to see more of her uh, in the movies. Her variants are awesome. She's had her own storylines. There's meat on the bone with this one, kind of like what I talked about last week with She Venom. There's meat on the bone with this. If you can pick up any Hope Summers variants and or first appearances, I'd grab them. She, they're going to be worth more money down the road. This is what we're talking about with the cold picks. Cold picks that have meat on the bone. For characters that have heat, that are liked, that have been in movies, and I promise you we're going to see her again at some point. She's too integral. If we're going to see Cable again, we're going to see his daughter again, or quasi-daughter, however you want to look at it. But my cold pick of the week is none other than my angel baby, Hope Summers. Is it anything to do with her? Talk to you guys soon. There we have Clint's pick. We're talking about Hope Summers. Now, it's no secret on this channel that I'm not a big X-Men reader, so I don't know. I can't speak too much on this character. I am familiar with that J. Scott Campbell cover that he's talking about, but you're more the X-Men fan. What do you have to say about this pick? Well, this one hurts my heart. Um, I, I, this is a character I love, similar to the way Clint described this character. Um, you know, X-Men to, 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 uh, <clears throat> you know, 205 is a book that everyone was chasing that J. Scott Campbell variant. It's it's a book like you said. Even non really X Men readers and fans, they know they're familiar with. They collect, and because of that, I made a different move a couple years ago, and I loaded up heavy on that regular cover A. I was picking them up for three dollars or less, and I was ready to make a move when Deadpool two dropped. Alas, she was already dead in the movie. So Clint says she appeared. I don't know. That's a um. That's a loose statement, but the events of the movie made it so that she could survive. So that does bode very well for the future. But we talk about the speculators. They don't have a lot of patience. Um, they're not ready to wait for Deadpool 3, 4, possibly an X-Force movie before we really see Hope Summers um, become the character that we all expect her to. I feel good about my books because I didn't pay that much for them. So it's okay. They're sitting in one of these short boxes over here to my left. And, um, you know, I'll just wait wait it out and wait for her time in the sun. But, you know, that run, that Messiah Complex run was really major. It was real formative for me when I got back into comics. Um, I talk all the time on this channel about growing up with the Jim Lee X-Men run, going back and reading the Claremont run. And the, uh, the J. Scott Campbell variants were really my kind of first introduction to J. Scott Campbell, but it was really the David Finch variants that did it for me during that run. And um, Hope Summers was such an important part, kind of the centerpiece of that storyline. Um, and it was also kind of the, you know, you had all the different X teams involved. It, it's kind of a great storyline. And guess what? In Feige, we trust. We can now do it in the MCU. So I think it's going to be even bigger and better. And I think if you invested in Hope Summers, the fact that she didn't appear in the last movie is a good thing. This is now a better and stronger investment. And yesterday, it was announced that Kevin Feige and the MCU are in fact in charge of those Fox properties. We're talking X-Men, Fantastic Four, and Deadpool. So now, that makes me feel very comfortable for the future. I know a lot of people, they don't like this because they love the way Deadpool came off. I mean, they're gonna change everything. Guys, in Feige, we trust he's going to take care of it, but he's going to make it take come to another level because he can integrate these stories with other characters. So I'm real bullish on Hope Summers. I think that a lot of speculators have forgotten about her. I'm not even putting out those X-Men 205s for sale because I know that they're not going to get the value that they truly have. So I'm happy to stick them in a box. But I suggest all of you out there in Simpleman's Comics family, go check out that book. See, Check out those stealth buys. You're not going to be able to get that Campbell cheap. That's just big in the variant market. That's a tough book. Um, Campbell fans eat that one up. I'm not saying don't buy it. I'm not saying it's not a good investment. It is, but it's a tough investment. But that cover A, that Mr. Sinister cover, that's one to keep an eye out for, especially with apparently so many people chasing Mr. Sinister right now. So if they're doing that and we know how he plays into this storyline, it's a pretty safe bet to look at Hope Summers. A lot of people are talking about something that came out yesterday about the movie stand, but it's kind of old news because they said that back in February that Deadpool was staying and that they were going to keep Deadpool R-rated. 
I, some articles came out again, I guess just reiterating. That just goes back to how short the attention cycle is for comet collecting, where it just moves past it and then it comes back again, being cyclical, and they put the same news out again, and then like, oh, okay, so everyone gets the warm and fuzzy. So there you have Clint's cold pick, and there you have the hot and cold list for this week. Got it up on the screen right now. What do you think about the list, Jack? Well, you know, it's one of those lit things where a lot of these books – people may not realize are truly hot. A lot of these topics, a lot of these kind of trends, um, it's not the things that you see showing up on the hot 10 list, but that's the beauty of the hot cold list is it's really showing you what could be next up, what's starting to move, what's starting to trend upward. You see characters like Totally Awesome Hulk. You see characters like The Eternals. You see characters like America Chavez. And you see a character like Namor. And you know that these are characters that haven't really done major numbers of late but they could be those next up characters we're moving into a new phase and that has everybody excited about what's coming next but i'll tell you something really interesting brian i'll tell you what you don't see you don't see dc comics right so i think again there's a lot of buying opportunity for dc comics because there's no characters that are sitting here hot right now with all of our great and talented writers, none of them could come with a DC Comics spec play, either hot or cold. And we've seen the cover Bs frequently be on the cold list, but we just haven't seen a lot of DC Comics hot picks. And yeah, I think that's indicative of reality. They're not hot, but we were just having this conversation in the CBSI Contributors Chat. I strongly believe that DC is going to get their movie slate together. I think with J.J. Abrams coming on, signing that exclusive with Warner Brothers, I think it's going to be a big deal. I think he very well could become the Kevin Feige for DC, That be that man that they're looking for to put everything under one banner. And I think a lot of those DC keys are undervalued. I highlighted New Gods earlier. I'll throw in Teen Titans characters. We just had the Titans trailer drop. And I know the Titans is cool, but TV spec doesn't move the needle like movie spec. But those those Teen Titans type keys are undervalued. Damian Wayne is undervalued. Um, so many members of the Bat family are undervalued, and uh, you know I think that that could be the stealth play. Definitely not hot, probably cold, but certainly some good buys out there. But like we said at the beginning of this video, we have CBSI swag to give away. So in order to win a shirt and hat, comment. In the video, not in the live chat if you're watching this during the premiere, but in the actual comments on the video, comment what your hot and cold picks are right now in the community of comics. We try to shy away from single issues, but if you have to put a single issue in there, by all means do so. But we're looking more for the trends like artists, authors, series, runs, CGC versus CBS, PGX. What in the comic community do you think is hot and cold? Signed books versus unsigned books. Either way, comment down below and you'll be entered to win a t-shirt and hat from CBSI Swag. Jack, anything you want to say before we go? Well, I want to thank the guys over at CBSISwag.com for sponsoring the Hot Cold Show. We truly appreciate all of their contributions to CBSI Nation, keeping us looking good, keeping us representing well at the convention. We appreciate everything they do. Those designs are on point, and we can't wait to get one member of the Simpleman's Comics family, part of the YouTube comic community, dripping right in all of that good CBSI swag. Right. And also make sure you tune in live tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern as we have the CBSI Bolo Show recapping the hottest comics that released this week first appearances variant buzz reader buzz and of course as always jack's long-term play that's going down right here on simple man's comics youtube channel tomorrow night 9 p.m eastern but that's not it brian because we have a new piece of content on the simple man's comics youtube channel tune in with us this friday at 9 p.m for the cbsi hot 10 comics list the longest running and only Hot 10 comics list. And I didn't say top 10. I said Hot 10. The only Hot 10 comics list that matters on the market. The one that you guys have been reading for five years. The one that you guys have been watching all over YouTube. And the one that is finally back home right here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Right. So that's Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern. New Hot 10. We got comics galore on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Make sure you tune in. Make sure you subscribe. Hit that bell notification so you're always notified when these new videos drop. And with that being said, 
Thank you for watching and good night.